Hi, everyone. My name is Tobias. I'm on the uh, strategy and operations team here um, in Dublin. And uh, I usually don't get to uh, interact directly with customers, uh, which is why I'm particularly excited to spend some time here, if, even if it's just 10 minutes with you, and discuss one of my very favorite topics, export. Why is it my favorite topic? Um, because I believe it's equally like a huge opportunity for you, and also an area where Google, with all the data and insights that we have, can really partner with you and help you succeed. But uh, in order um, to also give you a chance to, to express how you, um, how you view this topic, I would like to, to go through a little exercise. If you don't mind, uh, please stand up if you agree that export in general is a huge opportunity for your company. It's kind of a rhetoric question. I guess that's why you're all here. <laughs> Almost everyone standing. OK, good. Um, now, please remain standing. Um, please remain standing if you agree with me that identifying um, the right markets to expand your business into is a critical question, strategic question that you need to answer. Okay. Everyone seems to agree on that. Please also remain standing if you agree that it can be hard to find the right data and do the right analyses to identify those markets and uh, that Google um, can be a great partner to help you with that. Again, everyone is in agreement here. <laughs> Great. Now, um, please sit down if you have not yet um, had a, a live demonstration or a, a workshop of a tool called the Global Market Evaluator. Oh. Great. I guess the, the next session is then very relevant for you because I'd like to introduce you to the Global Market Evaluator and show you what it can do for you. In order not to just pick a random example, I'd like to invite Janos uh, from Foot Locker up on stage. I'd like actually um, demonstrate this tool along um, like a real life example. Thank you, Janos. So I guess um, we all know the industry that Foot Locker is in. You guys sell shoes. So step one of using this tool is actually selecting the right vertical and sub vertical. Right? In your case, footwear. Easy. Step two, we would like to select the metrics that you usually look at uh, for evaluating a market. Like what are the relevant um, metrics, internal like Google metrics for us, and um, macroeconomic variables that help you identify the potential of a market. So let's just go through the categories. Out of those uh, economic uh, uh, variables, which one would you say is relevant for Foot Locker? Mm -hmm. I would choose GDP as the most relevant. Okay. GDP. The next set of metrics is actually Google specific. And this is why this tool is unique and like no one else can show you those insights. Like which, one, uh, which ones of those uh, variables would you say are relevant for Foot Locker in making the decision to enter a new market? Um, let me just see, because it's over. Yeah, I would say Google CPC. Okay. It's uh, query depths and uh, yeah, query growth and volume is pretty interesting. Great. So query volume basically shows you how much um, Searches are there uh, for those for those terms, and growth shows you how how are they trending, right? Yeah. Now, um, a couple more internet-specific uh, metrics. Um, online purchases, of course, is uh, maybe the most relevant because desktop, laptop, tablet. It doesn't matter for us uh, what device say. Okay. Buy. And then uh, I'm not sure uh, how. Um, how, many, how much uh, effort you've spent uh, on, your, on your mobile platform, uh, if any of those may be relevant for you? Uh, yeah, we're actually working on uh, device-specific solutions, so um, Android usage uh, might be an interesting option. Thank you. And then finally, your target audience, uh, we can narrow down. Which one would you say is most relevant for Foot Locker? Uh, that's 15 to 24. Oh. For Rather young um, target audience, okay. Great, so now we've selected the metrics. The last and final step, uh, we need to narrow down the countries that we would like to look at. Which, which region or which, which countries are you interested in? Um, I would like to have a look at the Scandinavian countries. Great. So you go to EMEA, Western Europe, and then just select Denmark, Finland, Sweden, um, and Norway. Right? 
So what this does is basically it's creating a, a balanced scorecard, right? You select uh, the countries that, you, that you're considering for your expansion, and you select the metrics that you think are relevant in order to make a decision. And then as a next step, you can also uh, change the weights, meaning the relative importance of each metric. So uh, let's just quickly go through the GDP. Uh, GDP, would, I would rate with four. Okay. Query growth? Uh, gross as well with uh, four. Volume in general, maybe uh, three, because if we look at the future, gross is a little bit more important. Online purchases uh, is maybe two, as we also have stores, so that's not uh, the main criteria. Android usage is um, a three. Um, yeah, target group, I would rate with uh, three as well. Uh, CPC is a three, and query depths um, might be more relevant, so that's a four. Yeah. Thank you. So what this gives you, basically, is a relative ranking of the four markets that we selected in this example. And it allows you to create a shortlist to give you a first indication of what may be relevant to you. In this example, uh, it shows that Sweden um, is actually the market that you may want to take a closer look to. And we'll go through the next steps um, uh, in, the, in the next presentation. But um, while this is calculating a score for you, you can also, for the metrics you selected, look at the raw data. If you check this box, right, it shows you what, what the underlying data looks like. And then um, one more cool feature. You can very quickly graph things up if you would like to use this for an internal presentation. Let's say your x-axis is um, average CPC, your y-axis is query growth, and then the size of your bubble, um, for example, is your Android users if you're specifically investigating uh, the potential for creating an Android app. Right, so within seconds, um, you've been able to derive insights that may have taken uh, uh, quite some time previously, and with data that's internal, uh, Google data, that uh, um, no external consulting firm would even have access to, and uh, external data that they would charge you a lot of money for. Right? This is one example, like the first uh, step in the funnel of like which market should we enter, like narrowing it down to a specific uh, market uh, that we can very easily uh, support you with, right? for free and in minutes. So if you haven't had the chance, um, if you're interested, and you haven't had the chance to discuss this with your account management team, Maybe try um, to, uh, to either ask them uh, to, to schedule a, um, a workshop with you or like provide some insights based on this tool. And with that, I'm going to hand over to Julia, who's going to tell us uh, the next steps um, to answer the question, which, which market should we really enter? Thank you very much. Can you let me close it? What? No, it's fine. Leave it there. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm Julia, I work in the global expansion team here at Google. I'm pretty sure some of you guys already worked with us. Um, so actually, export is a journey. So having the data, uh, it's a great way to start. I think this is actually what we use at Google uh, ourselves to actually start the conversation. I have a lot of uh, clients that actually come to me and they're like, we want to expand, but we have no idea how to start. And this is definitely the first step we take, but it can be the only step. So I'm actually going to walk you through a bit of uh, a couple of tools that are actually available outside, so available externally, so that we don't have uh, only here at Google, but you guys have also access to. So I have a question for you. So this is the first step. We have uh, identified uh, with uh, uh, quantitative information uh, four potential markets. What else are, are you going to be looking at? If you were a food locker and you have identified these four markets, where would you start? So I'm not a baseball player, so I hope uh, there are some uh, hands uh, that are going to be raising from the front rows. Any ideas? Next steps. For food locker, if you were food locker, you have identified these four markets in terms of like a quantitative metrics. Next steps, what would you look at? Okay, I'll try my best, okay? <laughs> Not too bad. <laughs> no? On, on, the, on where it's written, actually. Other side? Yeah. Now you hear me, right? Um, I would look at competitors like, okay. who are already in the market. Perfect. How would you look at that? Um, probably through other agencies and like get a benchmark. Okay, so if you were alone at home, you would have to wait tomorrow to look at the competitors and wait for someone. 
Any other ideas of how would you look at that? You would Google it. Let's Google it. <laughs> how would you look at Google it though? Because there are problems with IP, so it's kind of, kind of tricky to understand the competitors. So actually, one thing that people always forget is this. So they come to me and they're like, you know, Julia, we have no competitors in that market. It's great. I, I just Googled my product and I couldn't find anybody there. I'm like, well, that might not be the case. So actually, I would use the Add and Preview tool. So this is actually a tool that is available externally. It's in your AdWords platform. You just go and select the market you're interested in. I just recently found, found out the shoes is actually SCO in the region. Pardon my pronunciation. Um, and here I can have a quick look at who are the competitors in this market. So we find a, a, a famous player, Zalando, and then we see other, other companies that are actually selling shoes. Um, in this case, Full Locker is not present in the market, but a lot of times what I do, I actually check for my own brand. So I want to understand who is actually even bidding on my keywords or who is actually um, going to appear if I put my own brand uh, into the ads and preview tool. So uh, any other ideas? What else are we going to look at? This is an export journey. So I looked at my competitors. Anything else? Yeah? Well. Okay, behavior. consumer behavior, that's great. How would you look at that? Yeah, we have a panel thing, so we actually will have a speaker talking about that. I'm gonna talk to you a bit about a part of it. So consumer behavior is definitely crucial for us, and uh, we actually have a team that actually specializes into looking at that. So for a client like Food Locker, uh, all these markets could be, could be potentially great, but there are also cultural considerations that you have to take into account. If the market was Germany, for example, Germany ha always looks great in the metrics. It's great, it's always the first market that pops in the tool. But then if you actually look at the return rates, you find out that Germany has a much higher turn rates than any, return rates than any other country in Europe. And for a distribution network like food that Food Locker has, that might not be a problem, but if you have a niche product and you're not able to serve uh, like the country, if you don't have the transportation system, this could actually be a real problem. So definitely consumer information. Any other thing? Come on, front row, you're supposed to be the best in class. No ideas. So how about the brand? Is the brand uh, famous in the market or is it not? Is, do you think it's relevant? Let's, let's say it's relevant, okay? For the sake of the, of the presentation. So we have a very quick tool to check this. So I know a lot of you use Google Trends, but I'm gonna show you how to use Google Trends in a bit of a different way. So instead of comparing search terms, I'm comparing locations, okay? So I'm gonna check these different markets that they propose to us, and I'm gonna check, is actually Full Locker present or not? So here I can add the location. I did it already for the sake of time. So I actually check Norway and not even Sweden. I check Stockholm. So in, my, in this situation, actually, Stockholm has more searches than the entire Norway together. Okay? This could be super important for a company that is first starting exporting into another market because it really helps you with the logistics. Um, I can also look easily uh, if there are like search terms, what are people looking at, uh, what are the brands that people are interested in. If you have to start building a campaign, if you are food lockers, who are the brands that you should start looking at? And this is a very quick way to do it. Uh, another thing, I'm not going to throw the tool, the, the puppet anymore because my, my arm is uh, hurting, so it's actually seasonality. People don't take into account the seasonality as much as they should. And we have seen uh, like tremendous impact on seasonality. Like we will see example in China uh, in the tomorrow session. Uh, we have examples in travel. Uh, it, it's, it's crazy, like uh, last week it was a Chinese New Year. And uh, I would say that only one third of the queries were coming from European travel clients compared to uh, uh, Asian clients. So it means that actually people in Europe didn't take that into account when building their campaigns, when actually planning their budget. So seasonality is crucial. And again, we have a tool that is available externally. 
is uh, the vertical trends tool. You can easily go in the uh, category that you want, so footwear in this case, and this gives you the search trends for footwear. You can select the country you're interested in, and it gives you the search trends, the growth, divided by devices. So in this case, we, we uh, the client actually mentioned that they're interested in um, having a device-specific strategy. So here you see the year-over-year -year that is actually growing uh, substantially faster uh, for mobile and smartphones. And this is a tool, uh, these are all resources that are available. You don't have to wait for your agency tomorrow to uh, come and help you. Um, all of these tools are actually in a repository. Guess what you have to do to find this repository? Google it. So if you just Google, think, uh, expert think with Google, you will find them. But also we are gonna send you actually an infographic with all the tools uh, that you have uh, external, that are externally available. So you're gonna receive them uh, after this event. So you don't have to write it down. If you want, feel free to. But um, in this platform, you can actually have a look at all the tools uh, that are externally available that you have access to. Um, of course, uh, for other research, for competitive benchmarks, for uh, having access to a GME, you can definitely contact your account managers and at Google we're happy to help. Um, but in general, like uh, this is something that you have there. If you're just curious about a market, I would recommend you to have a look at this. And the platform that you actually, your colleague uh, mentioned earlier, my colleague Alia now is gonna talk about it and you find it here, Consumer Barometer. Thanks very much. Cool, so if we can just go back to the slides. In the meantime, I'll introduce myself. Hi everybody, I'm Alia, and I work on uh, Google's Market Insights team. Um, so a lot of what we do on the team is about advertising effectiveness research and media measurement and that sort of thing, but we're also really responsible for the consumer behavior side of things, the consumer insights, and, and providing advertisers with sort of cutting edge consumer insights. And certainly, the consumer barometer falls under that bucket. Um, the consumer barometer is a fantastic tool, I think. Um, it's, this, it's, it's a huge resource um, which looks at three main areas of consumer behavior. So we look at device usage, uh, online video usage, and also path to purchase for a range of verticals. I'm waiting for my slides, but I don't think they're coming. Oh, there they are, fantastic. Um, okay, so, sorry, it's because I couldn't see it here. Um, okay, so, 56 countries we cover. We commission um, a research agency, Ipsos, to do a survey of more than 3,000 people in 56 countries, which means that altogether we have 200,000 interviews. Um, so, a hugely robust resource. Um, it means that every time you do a cut by sort of, by country, looking at a specific demographic, looking at a particular product, you're getting a reliable sample size. And you're actually able to compare across these markets consistently in a way that sort of no other resource offers you. So it's, it's, it's really a fantastic tool. We look at 10 categories in this wave, which are here. If any of these aren't relevant to you, we have 10 more coming, and the data for that is coming in July. So I would encourage you to check back. The other really important thing for you guys in the room is that in the next wave, we actually look specifically at some export questions. So we're asking people about purchases they've made from retailers abroad and sort of why they chose to do that, any issues they faced when doing that, and that sort of thing. So hopefully even more valuable information for you there. Um, so I'm going to continue for this demo, the Foot Locker example, and uh, we're going to look at, therefore, the clothing and footwear section. I'm going to pretend that Janusz found from the other export tools that Poland was a market that he was interested in, and we're going to keep it broad and look at males under 44. Um, so I'm going to jump over to the tool in just a second, but before I do, I have a little challenge for you. So um, the consumer barometer is beautifully optimized for tablet and mobile. And if you want, I'd like you to follow along with me as I'm actually doing as I'm actually doing the demo. I promise you, as long as the Wi-Fi is good enough in here, it's really good. And I have a little challenge. I want somebody to find me this statistic. So in the sort of device usage section, uh, you might need to jot this down. So for men in Poland under 44, what percentage of them are using their computers to look for product information weekly? Okay, computers for product information weekly, males under 44 in Poland. It's really easy, I hope. Okay, so to, to the demo then. Um, 
switch over to the demo. Beautiful. OK, so we're going to start in the consumer barometer. This is the sort of interface that you get when you first go on. On the left-hand side there, we've got the key findings where we've pulled out some interesting statistics by market. But on the right-hand side, we've got the graph builder where you can actually deep dive into the data. So we'll go into Graph Builder. First thing we get is the market. We're going to choose Poland for this. OK, now it gives you a bit of a snapshot of device usage in the country. You can see that smartphones still lagging behind mobile phone, for example. On the left-hand side there, you've got all the questions that you could dig into. So cut by those three categories, device usage, uh, path to purchase, and online video usage. For this, we're, we're interested in pass to purchase. That's what I'm going to focus on here. So we're going to go into the smart shopper. OK, huge range of questions here. Everything from how were people sort of first inspired um, through to sort of their research behavior, um, like how many brands do they consider during the research process, and then also down to purchase behavior. I'm going to start, I'm going to start fairly broad and go with in what ways was the internet used in people's um, recent purchase? First thing I need to do, though, is filter. So in our filters, I can go to the product category. Obviously, there I'm interested in clothing and footwear. But by demographic, I can go into that. I can select I'm only interested in males. Yeah. And for age, I'm only interested in everybody under 44. So I select the age brackets I'm interested in. I'm not, I don't want to compare them, though. I just want to sum them, because I'm looking at everybody under 44. OK? What I could also do, maybe of interest to sort of the luxury brands in the room, is look at income levels. So I can actually cut it by people depending on their income level. I've got three uh, different categories there. OK. So now that means uh, that on the right-hand side, I've got this graph here that's showing me for males under 44 in Poland, Thinking of their last clothing and footwear purchase, fully one in five became aware of the product online. A third of them actually bought that product online. And a nice large chunk there, 60% researching online. So clearly, you know, some real opportunity for Foot Locker to be present at all the stages uh, in that process. Let's look at, in a bit more detail then at things like the uh, research process. As I said, we could look at both online and offline sources of research. Um, in purchase behavior, we could look specifically at where they made that purchase. So, for example, you know, did they go directly to the brand, or is it more about looking at sort of auction sites, for example? We can also look at where they chose to purchase based on where they did the research. So, how do people who researched online complete their purchase? So, actually, fairly evenly split there between the store and online. Now, it's also really easy to uh, export this data. Say, I found a found a chart that I love. I want to be able to share it. In the top little corner here, we can click on that. And I've got now I can download all the data as a CSV file. Or I can actually get it as an image if I want to put it in a presentation. Or I can actually share that as a link and let my sort of colleagues have an explore for themselves. OK, um, so now we know sort of where people are doing their purchase. Maybe I want to know, because we're interested in mobile strategy, what devices are they doing that on? I can go to which device did people use for product research? OK, so clearly, in terms of research at least, fairly heavy on the computer still in Poland. But you know, about 20% currently using smartphones for product research. Really easy for me to now compare that to some other um, countries that I'm interested in. So I could just go in to, to filters, select, say, I don't know, Germany and Hungary. Um, so about the same, actually, it looks like in those markets, maybe slightly more smartphone usage in Germany. So again, just tons of different ways that you can cut the data by uh, by country, by demographic, and really easy to compare. I can also, if I don't like any of these filters, it's really easy for me to just get rid of them at the top there. Sticking with device, device usage, though, let's go into that category here, the multi-screen world. So I can obviously look at just things like which devices are people using, but I can go in and look at sort of in what combinations, how often are they going online, and then, of course, what online activities are people doing on each of these devices, so if I click on what online activities are people doing on their computers at least weekly, I'll get to my answer. And I don't suppose anybody in the audience thinks they got the right answer. Raise your hand if you think you did. Up there in the top, what did you think you had? OK, fantastic. Anybody else think they have an answer? OK, let's go and see if you're right. 
Wh what online activities do people do on their computers? So we've got 80% using search engines, 56% watching online videos, and 53%, the red bar at the bottom there, looking for product information. Yay! I have a fantastic prize for you here, a takeaway mug. I didn't promise it was great. Um, <laughs> so that's for you afterwards. Um, so that basically, guys, is the consumer barometer. There is a whole other section that I didn't actually explore there, which is div uh, video usage. You can go in and look at you know, how often people are watching, with whom, and so on. There's just tons there to explore. Um, so hopefully, a really valuable uh, tool for you and your business going forward. Thanks very much, guys. Hello everyone, Ooh, that's a bit loud. Um, so my name's Nathan, I'm a double-click search sales leader based in the London office, despite my accent. And I'm just gonna quickly talk you through today about double-click search and how we work with customers that are working on export and hopefully try and make their lives a little bit easier. So we've already heard about lots of great tools, but ultimately these tools will result in quite a lot of work. And that's what we're ultimately trying to do at double-click search is provide you with other tools that'll make that even easier to do. So this is Andre. Uh, Andre's got a really busy day completely focused on export. So we can see in the morning he's going to launch a bunch of Spanish campaigns in those markets. Um, no lunch for Andre because he needs to also then produce all the global and regional reporting uh, as well. And then he's going to spend most of the afternoon trying to figure out the right optimization strategy as well. So a pretty busy impact day. And one of the challenges that we find when we talk to customers is a lot of this work is based around manual processes. So what we want to do is cut down on those manual processes, you know, make it so you don't have to spend your life in Excel or on different spreadsheets, and then come up with different solutions for that. So for the first example, if we're launching campaigns in a Spanish market, one of the options that he could consider using um, would be this campaign cloner. So the campaign cloner does kind of what it says on the tin. It gives you the ability to copy existing campaigns into destination accounts. And you can inherit the settings, you can inherit the keywords and ads, and make it really easy to do a task that potentially could take you quite a lot of time. And we do that not only for Google, but across a number of other search engines as well. Um, Google's obviously not the only search engine in every market and the different representations there. And you can see that we can do that across and including Baidu now as well. Um, Yandex isn't a, is a deliberate omission. We don't support that at the moment. Uh, if you want to know why, ask Yandex at the end of the day. Um, the next most important thing that Andre had on his agenda was to focus on global and regional reporting. So it's great to be able to launch in a market, but how do you know whether that's successful? How do you know, uh, based on what you found out from the global market evaluator, whether you're making the most of the opportunity? So that's where we focus on reporting as well. So we have real-time reporting within DS. The sales information is reported within our, about a minute, and the, all the search engine information is about a 15-minute delay. So what this can do is roll back up into our reporting, and this on the screen here is our executive dashboards. So our de executive dashboards let you create these flexible dashboards which will work across all your different markets and territories, and then you can customise those into a visual editor to share within your company or even outside your company with your different suppliers, for example. And then we have a range of different options for you to share those and make it easy for people to access that information. So probably the most important thing and a large part of Andre's day was around optimization. So if you're launching in new markets, the new territories, and you need to make sure that you stay on top of having the right bids, making sure that your budgets are optimized as well. Um, so we have a, obviously a whole range of different options with here. And then one of those options is our performance bidding strategies. So these enable you to set targets and those targets are being constantly checked for every keyword and multiple adjustments to bids are being made every day and leveraging all that real-time data that we've got in the system. So this is an example for BravoFly, which is an Italian uh, kind of hub brand. And what they used was, you know, this specifically, specifically using our bid strategies to manage their really large long tail keywords across a number of different markets. And when they did this, they actually conducted some tests in the instance, so they did an A-B test, they chose different markets and compared the effect of using bid strategies to manage that versus the manual optimization processes that the likes of Andre were doing at the time. And by using our actual strategies and then obviously having a, keeping a close eye on those as well, they actually really saw significant informants. They saw a 55% increase in clicks within a 5% of their spend target and a 350% increase in conversion volume as well. 
So this can really make sure that you are making the most of those expert opportunities that you've identified and then being able to give you the transparency to understand where that comes from. So obviously this is the kind of th challenge of some of the things that we have within DoubleClick Search at the moment, but we understand too that things are changing. So at DoubleClick Search, we continue to evaluate the product. You're going to hear from the AdWords team a little bit later about what AdWords are doing to meet the challenges of exporter. But our approach to this is also to understand that how is this evolving and thing, and the fact that the landscape will continue to change. So we know that there is media fragmentation in the market. We also know that the way that people searching is changing as well, uh, and that's as the way that search engines themselves behave, but the consumer interact with different devices. And the final is we see, you know, a range of ad more formats coming. So we can't really control how this changes. If anything, this change is accelerating. So our approach to this is to make sure that we can control how fast we adapt to that. So in DoubleClick Search, we're really committed to releasing a lot of new features, and we tend to focus those in three core areas. So we don't have the time to go through our roadmap in DoubleClick Search today, but the three areas that we're working on at the moment is focusing on better workflows, so what is it possible to maybe ingest different fees in different languages and automatically output campaigns uh, with add to copy that's updated in real time? How can we keep pace with the transformation of search to ensure that we support new ad formats or new type of things that we'll be hearing a little bit later? And finally, how do we give you additional optimization options? So obviously just optimizing bids is only one challenge. What about creative optimization? What about different forms of testing too? So again, we know what we want to focus on is how we can develop these tools for the future, and we're really interested in working with people and understanding their feedback so that we can do just that. So in terms of next steps, you know, get in touch with your DoubleClick Search team, uh, whether you're a client already or if you're an agency as well, and then they'll help you understand of the variety of different features that we have, how we can best help you make the most of the export opportunity. Hello everyone, um, my name is uh, Stefan Erhard. I uh, work in an organization that helps to launch products uh, on the advertising site in Europe, Middle East and Africa. I'm 11 years in the company uh, by now, so I've seen AdWords evolving a lot over the years and um, my presentation hopefully will come up in a minute. Um, but uh, what for me was always a really important theme is automation. How many of you here in the room already spent hours setting up a campaign, making keyword changes, ad text changes, CPC changes? Please raise your hand. Time of your life that you will never get back. <laughs> so uh, for me, this theme is a really important one for Google as well. Uh, we are also trying to help you in this space. And um, I would like today to give you a bit of an outlook of uh, what's happening on the creative side with uh, dynamic ads that might be uh, really interesting for you to know. But first of all, um, I know we have people here from different industries and different markets. I think one thing you all have in common is like, you all want to, when you want to go abroad, uh, grow your business and somehow make profits out of it. I think that's what we all have in common. Um, how do you do that usually? You first of all measure everything so you know what's going on and then try to find ways, find the right CPA to uh, maximize your profit. Um, and how do you do that? To increase your share of voice in the market by capturing the full demand. I think this is something all industries have in common. It doesn't matter which uh, market you enter. Um, but this is not easy. When you think about it, think about your own industry. Think about uh, what kind of products or services you offer. It doesn't matter if you're a retailer or a travel client. Um, we tend to have um, a lot of um, inventory that we have to manage uh, with AdWords campaigns. Uh, 50,000 products for a retailer is not uncommon. Um, you have a travel website, all kind of offerings um, are um, requiring a lot of, lot of keywords and uh, a lot of, lot of management. And even worse, this can be extremely dynamic uh, based on product availability um, or based on uh, content that users uh, create. Uh, this is highly, highly dynamic. And this would require a lot of, lot of changes on your campaign. Then, on the other hand, we have the user, another very unpredictable beast, because 
users uh, search in ways that you might not even guess. Um, if you go into other markets that you don't know very well, it can be even more crazy. Um, so today, when you look at Google overall, uh, we have still today a lot of queries on Google that we have never seen before. People search for things we would have never ever guessed. Companies like you launch maybe new products and services with new names that are completely new that never existed before. Um, so it's really hard to predict what users search and then try to find the right keyword to match that um, is not that easy. Not even to mention that users are getting more and more mature and advanced and search in a very complex setup with more and more keywords. Um, so you can't book all those keywords as exact keywords in your campaigns. So what does it mean specifically then for you as an advertiser? Um, when you look into all kind of keywords that might be relevant for your business, you have of course kind of a head, so high volume query keywords that are super important for you. Um, but there are also a lot of a lot of other keywords that are somehow report uh, important for your pr uh, services or your product that you're selling. So as this is highly dynamic, um, you basically have a hard time to have a great 100% keyword coverage. It's actually impossible uh, in a way. That means you're losing possibilities to sell your products and services because you're just not showing up. You had no idea that this keyword might be used by user to find a product or service that would be uh, basically the one that you're selling. Um, we have a product, Dynamic Search Ads, that can help you to make this way more automated. Um, think about how cool would it be if I would not have to manage all kind of keywords for all kind of products that I'm offering, where I don't have to look into all kind of site changes that I have to do and make them basically not only on your own content management system, but maybe also on the AdWords campaign, keep them up to date, et cetera, et cetera. Dynamic search ads can help you in this context uh, to be um, way more scalable, automated, and successful. Let me quickly explain how that works. Um, what you do first of all as an advertiser is you can set up um, and define first of all the product and service you would like to advertise and set up a campaign um, where you basically just define the budget, uh, kind of a creative, um, how the ad should look like uh, that you want to see on search and you put your, let's say, landing page behind that. In the next step, the user is trying to find a product or service. So he goes to Google, is entering, like in this example, a budget hotel in New York City. We, in our backend, then try to find the match and see what kind of advertisers have this product or service. And then try to show the ad that makes more sense. Assuming no one else has this specific keyword, budget hotel in New York City, booked as an exact keyword, we would try to find an advertiser in the travel space who has this product um, up for sale. And then would show the ad automatically generating the ad text out of it. It's pretty cool uh, because this allows you to be way, way more efficient, especially when you have a lot of products, especially when you have a lot of, lot of inventory that you have to manage. It can save you a lot of time because, I mean, when you do it in one market, that's one thing. But think about if you have to do that, like uh, what was the example, um, the fashion player that Gary presented earlier this morning when you're in 190 markets. Uh, it's getting a bit complicated. Um, and the good thing is this dynamic search ad product works with all kind of our other functionalities. There are no exceptions. You can use all our auto bidding tools so you can not only automate the creatives, you can also automate the bidding to reach, for example, a certain CPA. And you have all the time still full control into it and uh, see detailed reporting on what actually the users try to find. And based on that, you can set up, uh, for example, additional um, campaigns. So we looked into all our advertisers who use uh, broad match keywords, phrase match keywords, and exact match keywords, and put DSA into comparison and try to evaluate what is um, uh, the best performance we see um, as an average across the board. And DSA is clearly outperforming our broad match keyword performance and phrase match keyword performance. The only one that is really better is the exact match keyword performance, but it's really hard to set up uh, AdWords campaigns with all kind of exact match options um, that users may try to find. If you only have exact match op options for all your campaigns, you might lose out a huge amount of inventory and you have um, a, a huge uh, gap basically on, on reaching the users. Uh, let's be very concrete. 
Um, I give you here three examples from uh, some of our clients who use dynamic search ads uh, in, in three different purposes, in three different ways. Uh, La Redoute, it's a French retailer, for those who don't know them. They basically use dynamic search ads to identify new keywords because they say, okay, um, we know the products we sell and we have kind of an idea what keywords are important to book. But as I said earlier, users are completely unpredictable and maybe search in very different ways. So they basically use dynamic search ads reporting to identify the keywords that basically gave them a really, really uh, great performance and took them afterwards and set them up as an exact match with a separate campaign because exact match keywords beat basically uh, dynamic search ads. Holiday Check, um, it's a company for those uh, from markets who don't know them uh, that's comparable to TripAdvisor. Um, they have the challenge that their content is constantly changing. Um, users generate uh, content, add new reviews, but they wanted to make sure that they are uh, probably um, advertising for all the sections of their website, um, the, the, uh, the possibilities that are available with Holiday Check. They use this to have a full website coverage and be always highly relevant um, to uh, what they are uh, offering as a service. And then we have another example, this time from the tech industry, from a Romanian company, Surf32, who used uh, dynamic search ads to expand globally. Um, I think all of us have this challenge. When we go into a new market, the, I would say the, one of the key things is to be really successful is ideally have someone who knows this market extremely well. I mean, I'm German, I can speak a bit of English, I would say, um, but I wouldn't claim myself being able to do a great performance of a campaign in English. And I might would leave out and forget about a lot of keywords that are really important. Um, and with dynamic search ads, you could make sure that you identify all the relevant keywords, even uh, you, or basically the, all the relevant uh, users you could reach. Uh, without knowing exactly what you um, have to enter as a keyword. In the context of export, uh, this is extremely uh, powerful because I have an example from a travel client um, who is from the Western countries who said, I want to be available globally in all kind of markets. So they had a pretty good uh, team of people in France, Spain, UK, uh, Germany, US. So dynamic search ads helped them to some extent to reach more users. Um, so they had kind of 10% uh, an average across Europe and America where they got more uh, conversions out of it. But what for, was for them personally really a game changer is like um, going into Middle East and Africa because they had not a lot of people in their company could help them to set up campaigns for those markets. And the dynamic search ad uh, product who is kind of using basically the algorithm from Google um, for, for uh, showing more relevant ads to users, uh, gave them an amazing return and a lot of um, additional uh, revenue um, for this specific part of the world that was for them uh, pretty new. To, to sum that up, I mean, I think what you all have to keep in mind is like, right now you may be only active in a handful of markets. Um, if you want to be really efficient with your division or your company, you always have to find ways to automate things and to be more scalable. Um, and we can help you with that, with our uh, automated products. We have more and more um, that uh, we uh, will introduce over the next quarters to help you to make your life easier, um, but still have, at the same time, always control about everything and insights into what's really going on so that you can still a step in if things are not going the way uh, you, you like to see them. But the idea is basically you should not spend time on making keyword changes, ad text changes manually. Try to look into the bigger picture and create value for your business overall and not just for your individual detail of each of the campaign. Um, and uh, think about it in a way I always say is like, how do you manage your campaigns today? Um, assuming you would not get additional headcount for your team, for example, and you have to enter 20 new markets, would you manage your campaigns the same way? Um, maybe not. So automation is becoming a really important piece of it uh, to, to become um, more focused on what really matters for your business. Thank you very much.
Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Brian Oppenheim. I'm an engineering lead working on AdWords in Google's Los Angeles office. And uh, as an engineer, they don't usually let us out in the wild too often to talk to customers. So I'm incredibly excited to hear uh, more about your business and to tell you a little bit about what we're working on. Up here with me is our product manager, Deep D. She works in our New York office. And Dora C., she's our user experience designer, and she's with me in Los Angeles. In partnership with the internationalization team that Google has in Mountain View and your sales team here in Dublin, we begin looking at different ways we can bring export into the AdWords interface. In a few minutes, Doris and DeepD are going to tell you a little bit about the product and design principles we apply at Google to make a product into a real thing. I'm actually going to start with telling you a little bit how we got started. This is a pretty good example of how products get their kickstart here at Google. So many of you have been telling your account managers for a while that you feel constrained in your local markets. There's a lot of competition, and you've wanted to expand. And over those last couple of years, as the account managers have been helping you, export became a key strategy. And as you all know, it's one of the most important parts of our business now. You also know that deciding to export is one thing, but actually doing it is another. Lots of things to think about, campaign translation, website translation, customer service, uh, just to name a few. And these are all things that your account managers have been helping you with, but it ends up being a lot of manual, repetitive work for them. And as you know, Google is all about scale and doing it the way that it's being done now, not like the rest of the business. So several months ago, the sales team came to us and asked if there was some work that our team could do to help make the process more efficient for our customers and for our, um, the sales team. And so right now, we're looking into building such a tool. Some of the things we asked ourselves as we started on this journey was what's most important for the customers. And as you've seen in the earlier presentations, and I'm sure in many other things Google's presented, this is really key for us. This product will only succeed if we're able to deliver on the things that are most important to you. We also want to make sure that we're solving sales use cases because making them more efficient gives them more time to work with you. And of course, we're asking ourselves, what's going to have the biggest bang for the buck? And sort of what we've come to there, um, the two themes that we're going to look at is helping you implement your campaigns and also identify opportunities for export. How we're going to take this and turn it into a real product, Deep D and Doris are going to talk about that right now. Hi. Um, so at Google, our goal is to build products that will benefit our users. Uh, this means being very disciplined about how we build them. So I'll go through three product principles that we try to follow when we are building new products. Uh, so first is innovation, not instant perfection. So there are two uh, schools of thought on how to build great products. One is the castle building approach. So you go into a castle, you work on a product for a long time, and then you launch it to uh, users, hoping that it would be a perfect product. If you get it right, there's a wow effect. However, if you don't, uh, you have a dud on your hands that you have spent years building. Google's approach is slightly different. We, uh, when, we try, when we build a product, we try and strip the feature set uh, to, a very, uh, to its core essence and launch it to our users to see if they find it fundamentally useful. Uh, the advantage of this approach is that uh, you're always making steady progress towards that perfect product. Uh, we genuinely believe that ideas come from everywhere. So an important part of building products is to make sure that everyone is involved in the decision-making process. Uh, as an example, we have an internal tool where everyone can submit ideas and vote on them before they're routed to the relevant product team. We also have periodic brainstorming sessions where the entire team takes a step back and thinks about what uh, they should be doing next. Uh, the export tool that Brian talked about is an excellent example of this, where the original idea came from the sales team. Uh, and as part of this uh, event, we would really love to hear your thoughts on what should the AdWords team be building to uh, help you all with the export journey. Uh, building products is a very subjective process. There are lots of people who have their uh, own opinion, and oftentimes it's not clear what's the right thing to do. Uh, so we believe that the best way to build consensus is to make the decision-making process as objective as possible. Uh, data is apolitical, and uh, decisions based on hard data tend to be much more closer to ground reality uh, than our personal biases. 
Uh, there's obviously a danger of going too far, uh, but if you can strike the right balance, there's nothing quite like it. I'll now hand it over to Doris, who will walk you through the design process. So what really happens when an engineer, PM, and designer walk into a bar? <laughs> We're actually the ones behind the counter. Just like mastering that perfect cocktail, a lot of research, brainstorming, and trial and error happen before we put anything out on the menu. In order to build and craft products that people love, teams of every single size need to maximize their customer learning. You see, too much time is wasted up front, producing that big old grand design without really doing much research. So the client won't end up hating it only after it's been served. We are in danger today of over-designing, but also designing the wrong recipes for the wrong needs. That's why, like our product team, we always kick off by having real conversations with real people earlier on in order to discover and define those, those uh, challenges that we really want to learn about and maximize on. If we were to completely ignore getting to know our targeted audience, then you know, we would probably be building products at Google that were led by assumption and personal opinion. However, if we were to lead on educated progress, then the right foundation towards new product innovation is within arm's reach. <clears throat> so after we do all the initial UX interviews and research, and we kind of unfold the list of challenges of today's advertisers that are working in AdWords right now, we kind of have a basic understanding of our clientele. Using design sprints at Google, we engage in these free-form think storms to basically generate a, pool of, uh, of, generate a pool of vast ideas directly and creatively with experts in the field in a short amount of time. What can last anywhere between a couple of hours to a few days, a design sprint is basically Google's secret weapon and quickest shortcut to learning without building and launching. At this point, you probably think I'm going to be showing you and projecting a bunch of neatly laid out wireframes and beautifully illustrated style frames. But even for the most creative individuals, those signature items and pixel perfect designs don't just fall out of clear blue skies. If anything, the earliest manifestations of products at Google look something like this. And they stay looking like this for quite a bit of time. So perhaps it's not the most beautiful, or it's not even the most recognizable. But low fidelity sketching is really what moves a, uh, moves a team from having good design to great design. By really focusing, and really focusing on those uh, core decisions about your product framework, all those finite details like color, typography, responsive grid, imaging, those things will follow relatively easily, quickly, and naturally. So over the last 10 minutes, Brian Deepthi and I really just shared what is the start of making user experiences meaningful, honest, and above all, delightful. But as a product team, if we really want to put something out on the menu and make it stick, then there is a constant and continual need for the sharing of the minds. So as the people serving you behind the counter, we invite you to actually join our Google Listen session tomorrow afternoon to participate in product brainstorming. It will be a lot of fun. It will be super creative. But what could future export tools look like in AdWords? On behalf of our team across LA and New York, there's an ample amount of opportunity to participate in usability studies and actually get a sneak peek at what design process is all about before tools actually developed and engineer. So thank you for listening to our story, and we actually looking forward to actually meeting you later on and hearing all about your story as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you.